Um, my name's Sandy Yule, and uh, I'm talking with John and Jenny Adams. Uh, we're having trouble technically, which is why their uh, picture is turned off for the moment. I'm going to turn mine off in a minute. John and Jenny and I uh, shared time at the Fitzroy Church in 1973. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that from their point of view rather than mine. And they went from there to Aracoon uh, to work with Aboriginal community there uh, in the under the auspices of the church uh, in Mission. Um, so let me turn my video off. And John and Jeannie, welcome. <laughs> um, I'd be interested to hear what you, wh whether you had much contact with SCM prior to coming to the Fitzroy Church in 1973. That's right. We, Jeannie and I met through SCM at my ash uni mm -hmm. in the uh, 1970s, early 1970s. No, 68. 68. <laughs> Different, different memories of meetings, go on. <laughs> yeah. We got married in 1970. That's right. Uh, and I served um, time as president of the SCM committee mm -hmm. at Monash. Mm -hmm. and during our time together through the SCM at Monash, we also uh, became involved in Aboriginal issues. Jenny mm -hmm. was person behind um, organising some lunchtime lectures for mm -hmm. students and interested staff at Monash during our time there. I had the ideas and John did the organising. <laughs> <laughs> good, good work. So we invited a number of um, Aboriginal leaders from around Melbourne to come and speak at that time at Monash. Mm. And, uh, Tim, and we, oh, how, did you, how did you end up at the uh, Fitzroy Church in 1973? Oh, well, okay. I started theological study um, at the beginning of the 70s and, uh, mm -hmm. and wanted to become involved in a, um, in a church that was engaged in community development, community organising, social issues. And at that time... Brian Howe was the minister there. He, he had established Cure at the Centre for Urban Research and okay. Education and Action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, tell me about the invitation to go to Aracoon. How did that come? Well, I think we should go back a little bit because in 1965, mm -hmm. as a young as a student, I actually went to Aracoon for a few weeks um, and that was my first experience of Aracoon. And then in 1971, quite sort of by chance, John was looking for a placement as a young theologue and we went to Aracoon again. Uh, so we both knew Aracoon. Mm. Um, I'll turn and, my phone down. Yeah. So, um, so we were, in fact, there was a bit of a Friends of Aracoon group happening. Anyway, so we, John's exit placement was at Middle Park, um, South, South, Melbourne South Melbourne Mission, and we were living there and we had our first child in 74, and, but we had decided that we wanted to do something um, take our family to the third world and do some work in the third world. And to cut a long story short, there were some other possibilities, but it turned out that they, um, we agreed that an Aboriginal um, community would be good. And then it turned out that Aracoon needed somebody. Hmm. At the time, Aracoon was struggling with the impending um, mining development of the area and they were having a few struggles and needed some community development. That wasn't quite seen the same way by the management. But um, anyway, we, John had a, was appointed by Bo, Bomar as the um, assistant manager to start with. Hmm. 
And, um, and then we, uh, so by 76, this was all finalised and we had our second child. We had a few weeks to gather ourselves together and we were off to Arakan. Okay. And how long were you at, actually at Arakan? Eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. So we went there in 76 and we came back to Melbourne in 84, late in 84. So you, you already knew something of Arakan before you went, but... We did, yeah. My, my big question here is really, um, what's your memory of, of uh, how you encountered it and adjusted to it? Mm, well, it was probably the best years of our lives, really. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we went with a commitment to... <coughs> helping people to achieve justice. Um, we also had a commitment to being part of the community, which um, was unfortunately a bit of a rare thing. A lot of staff just went as um, staff in a fairly distant sort of role. Um, and we sort of different various different ways over the years of of doing that so for john it was through administration through social security through out of education outstation development and i mean you can talk about all those more but and i was through the arts mainly through um helping people to um develop a bit of a and we just already started an industry around their um, traditional arts and crafts mm. and and some modern arts as well. Mm. What would you want to say about the um, your work, John, in terms of outstations and uh, social security issues and whatever? My appointment at Arakoon through the Mission Board then was not as a uh, minister fulfilling a pastoral role. There was already a, uh, a minister at Arakoon who was responsible for the pastoral work in the congregation at Arakoon. Mm -hmm. My role specifically was community work and community development. Mm -hmm. So as Jenny mentioned, the, uh, the main issue at that time and the reason why we went to Arakoon was to support their people in their struggle against what was likely to be a large mining, bauxite mining development on their uh, traditional land. So it was a community organising role that I had and it was a matter of um, listening to where, you know, people's hopes and dreams and issues were and responding to those. Looking back, so, uh, looking back on that struggle, uh, what would be your comment on on how all that went, the um, the mining development? It's still going. <laughs> the struggle is still uh, going. Yeah, well, it's changed a lot. It's changed, changed a lot. Bit, but um, so the the state government um, declared a bauxite mining lease over the northern half of the Arakan Reserve mm. in 1975. Mm. And that was opposed by the community with support from the church was able to um, take the Bielke Peterson government, Bielke Peterson was the premier at the time, to court and challenge the decision that was made by the government to put that mining lease over their land without any proper consultation and agreement from the people themselves. Arakoon won that case in the High Court. It was a matter of um, um, successfully arguing that the the trustee of the Arakoon Reserve, who was the Director of Aboriginal and Islander Affairs in Queensland at the time, had not fulfilled his duty properly to consult and find a, an agreement from people about how any mining might or might not happen. However, uh, 
the Queensland government appealed against that decision by the High Court. We then had in still going in Australia, the uh, Privy Council in England became the, the next, that was the highest level for uh, the courts in those days, not the High Court, the Privy Council. And Arakan lost at the Privy Council mm -hmm. and mining. The mining uh, lease was um, was ratified and it then became over the years a matter of when that mining consortium that had that lease might or might not um, start work on the on its uh, mining development. But no mining happened while we were there. Hmm. Since then, there's been other companies that have taken over the lease and still no mining has happened on the lease. At the moment, Glencore is the body that has the, has the lease. Mm. So is this lease totally open-ended or does it have a sunset clause of any sort? No, it's open-ended. Mm -hmm. Oh, there will be some conditions mm -hmm. for what they are, but um, there'll be an expectation that Glencore do some sort of mining. <laughs> but the other thing is that in the meantime, probably because of various changes, people are not against mining as much as they would have been back then. They see mining as probably the only opportunity to get employment. Nobody else is organising any jobs, so... Mm. The miners might do better for them than anybody else. Uh, I think the government probably has that view too, that it would be handy to have some miners come and put some money in instead of them having to bother. Yes, yes. Okay. So what else uh, happened during your time at Arakoon that um, was it important to you for the future there? Uh, well, your future, I just what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I... I think I think it was really vital for us as as a family. If there's anything has changed for us, it's been our what Arakan has done for us as people. I mean, we've just learnt a different view of the world. I guess um, we've learnt to appreciate um, things about the the social world, the natural world that we in in more depth than we could have without, you know, actually living out in the dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we've we've learned another language and what it means to have a language which is so very different from English. Um, and And we've learned how I learned a lot more about family, I guess. I mean, by by accepting an invitation to be adopted into a family, we've learned something of what that means to actually have a um, be included in another in a family in which, yeah, we're just family's different, I guess. Family's more inclusive and more expansionary than than. Australian family, uh, white Australian families. I imagine that it's uh, it's also more demanding in terms of um, your, your responsibilities within the family. How, how does that work? <laughs> well, it probably is, but it also it's taught us a bit about being a white fellow in an Aboriginal community. We we have the best of both worlds, really, because we we can mm. take it or leave it. You know, we have a sort of responsibility, but we can opt out, um, which is a bit unfair, but it's sort of <laughs> necessary. <laughs> to follow, I suppose. You're in, in that liminal space between two communities and their ways, and uh, you get to choose yeah. exactly where you, you land within that space. Yeah, you I, do. I, I do yeah. recognise that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's also quite an ambiguous space sometimes, well, particularly when it comes to conversation with people and, and when you do become a sort of a, a part of the community and then you have a conversation and you're not quite sure whether which which um, mode of language is being used, whether we're using their way or our way. Mm. And sometimes, because sometimes 
words have opposite sorts of meanings. Yes. Um, yes, I can imagine yeah. that, um, that, that learning the indigenous language, you also encounter them learning our language and that they yeah. come into this space as well. So a little bit, I won't say detached from, from their culture, but <clears throat> alongside their culture in an in a important way, but also very uh, difficult to be, be sure which way is up at times, I think. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and of course there you also encounter another huge disadvantage and injustice in that, well, the kids are taught from their earliest days in English, although mm -hmm. Mm. Speaking constantly in Wickmorgan or Wicknuthan at home, but they'd go to school and they have to try to understand our concepts in our language. And they, their teachers often don't have any idea how foreign those things are to the kids. Yes. And, um, yes. Yeah. Mm. So and it's also, an, yeah, oh, just a, an indicator. People are very, very committed to their language and um, yeah that, that yeah well wait, you, we find you find if there's something to, to do with language going on in school the adults will come in a way that they wouldn't come otherwise yes I mean language clearly is the is the key to culture and uh, and they know mm. it <laughs> yeah and we yeah. should know it also yeah yeah mm. yeah now tell me where, where life took you after Arakuni. Uh, we came back to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. I took up an appointment as Minister of St Kilda Mission, Uniting Church Mission. Well, this was partly a, a, a need for us to reconnect with our Victorian families, for our kids to see their actual grandparents for a yes. while. <laughs> and um, and have a bit of a break, but that would be yeah, gone. So um, we were at St Kilda for five years, mm -hmm. and um, really enjoyed the the ministry there. Mm -hmm. There'd been my predecessor, Granton Hay, and the congregation had set up a a support program for people with psychiatric difficulties who are living in fairly poor living conditions in boarding houses and rooming houses and on the streets around St Kilda at the time. And that was a uh, like a day support centre, which was started in the, the kindergarten property of the, uh, of the St Kilda Church. And no longer functioning as a kindergarten, but as a support centre. Is that right? Mm, yeah. yeah, and that's still going. Mm, yeah. Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah, funded over the years by uh, Victorian Health Department. Mm. 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 And after South Melbourne, South Melbourne. after St Kilda, St Kilda, I mean. Yeah. But just one, yeah, one more thing, just before we go back to after that because that's a, another move but um, <clears throat> I also took the opportunity to do something I'd been sort of wanting to do which was develop some of my own artistic expression and um, and I wrote a, a couple of books well I wrote one that was published while we were in Melbourne Pigs and Honey mm. Mm. which um, was uh, in a way I think in a, an odd sort of way, my expression of my anthropology through um, through art. Um, so at that time in Australia, there were very few books for kids that actually had Aboriginal or Islander characters in them. Yes. So any books that you could find about Aboriginal people were about dreamtime stories or... Um, things like that, but not just about kids being kids. So Pigs and Honey was a bit of a, um, a watershed in a way because it was just a story about a family going out hunting. And um, it back then publishers were looking for things like that. I was lucky and, um, and it was reasonably successful book. 
And then there was going for oysters, which was a sort of a companion about going fishing. Mm. And, um, well, those books sort of have a, um, a sequence later, but we'll come to that later. We'll get back yeah. to it. It's very yeah. important. Thank you. Yeah. And then, John, you were, what happened next? After five years at St Kilda, um, we were called back to work with um, Aboriginal people through the Uniting Church, Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress to work in community development um, and to be based in Cairns. And they had set up uh, an institute for community development called the Algobinby Institute, um, which um, I was asked to help um, get established in its work. And um, we moved to Cairns and did a lot of community development work in the Cape, also including going back to do the work at Arakoon. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the, um, the move back to do this had been accompanied by what was believed to be a big grant of money that was going to support your work, which turned out to be not there. <laughs> so, so the next few years, John had to work very hard to actually bring in the money to support his position. Oh, it was consultancy work. Consultancy we, work. We yeah. were able to be uh, remunerated in that way through the organisation and the Uniting Church. Yeah. So that was about eight years in Cairns. And after Cairns, we moved to Townsville. And uh, we moved uh, to Townsville so I could um, start what I thought was an important initiative, and that was to become involved in teaching community development studies to remote Aboriginal adults. And we set up a program of community development training mm. in Townsville where we had the premises to do that. That took a long time. In the meantime, you also worked with the Congress. Yes, I was in a support role in the Congress nationally. And, um, and then at the end, um, with the Queensland branch of the Congress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should, is, is, should you mention what the Congress was and how it was set up in that time, early? What do you think, Sandy? Do people um, understand? It, I think it'd be helpful just to say that the Uniting Aboriginal Island of Congress was set up uh, nationally by the Uniting Church as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander wing of the Uniting Church and with its own autonomy in, in fairly carefully defined ways. That, that's how I understand it. Yeah, Is that right. roughly right? That's correct. Mm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, became part of the constitution of the Uniting Church. Yeah. yeah. That's and, right. And, and so we're, we're not so bothered by changing our constitution in the United Church because we need to <laughs> the purpose. Uh, once, you, uh, once you open up to the reality of Aboriginal people, uh, Western constitutions don't work so well. That's a, a comment from me. <laughs> well, so that was, I think, in, I think, 85, around that time. Mm, 85 was, was Congress, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and the preamble to our constitution um, came quite a few years later. In 2009, yeah. I, I was well, there. <laughs> you were involved in some of that. I yeah. was involved in the assembly, in that assembly, and uh, witnessed the... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so... Talk a bit more about your teaching, the course you taught. So, first of all, there was a long process of setting up a, an RTO, which is harder than anyone might think. But having set that up, you then designed courses. Which yeah. Fairly yeah, unique. This would have been groundbreaking stuff, I imagine, because uh, you're meeting a need that I don't believe was widely recognised in too many places. Uh, so tell me the about word community. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, government policies in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s 
always mention the words community development. Mm. But um, I think you're right. There wasn't a lot of understanding about what that actually might mean in practice um, in terms of government interaction with communities and implementation of their own policies. But anyway, I think my... I mean, I learned so much about community development working at Arapoon and um, community organising. And I just, in my mind, it's um, it's a key strategy for positive social change in communities. If you have people working on the ground, able to respond to the uh, ambitions and dreams that people have and listen to their um pain and uh anger as well the negative stuff that's part of human life it just seemed to me that it was important um following on from the involvement that i had at that level to be able to um share some of uh my experiences and help in teaching skills people in um in what were then the remote communities, which to us seem the most disadvantaged in terms of having any kind of um, adult education opportunities mm. open. Mm. Mm. So that was our clientele for, for the community development training was adults who were already involved in lo lots of different ways in their own communities, um, working to improve their, their own families and uh, and communities, mm. but also to get certificates, to get to get a piece of paper to acknowledge their skills and to help them in getting employment. Mm. And this, yeah, is, people. This, and this, and this is the key point I think about acknowledgement because uh, and unless you've got recognition of skill uh, from government, you're not going to get very far. You know, they're going to keep seeing you. They know what they know best, uh, and, yeah. and, and mm. a piece of paper says, "Well, maybe." Maybe they can learn a little from, from some of these people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But also some of these people, their um, their actual literacy skills were very low. So that, that was part of the, um, the challenge that John had was to teach people um, without the, um, you know, the book learning that, that so many academics depend on. Yeah, I used to have, um, I used to have a, a little accompanying booklet of readings for people to look at when they were doing the different units of study. Yes. And I soon found that no one ever read them. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um, they weren't, weren't in, highly into reading uh, <laughs> any of the theory of community development very much. But anyway, yeah, it was good. It was, um, I think it was helpful. It also gave people who, who are working on their own, in their own ways, with their own families, in pretty isolated communities, um, coming together in Townsville. For residencies. For three residential blocks a year. Mm. Gave people a chance to um, build up solidarity with other people to share common experiences. And it was um, helpful from that point of view as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that institute is still going strong, is it not? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, you shouldn't oh, Well, no, no, the answer is no. The so, answer is still yeah. going, but it's not teaching community development anymore. So okay. after we left council, the um, community development um, was the, the institute was moved to Bundaberg and they the people operating the institute in Bundaberg um, they developed another set of courses and they had other priorities not community development okay so that's still going yes yes that's what I'd heard of, so I assumed it was the same, but you're telling me it's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and um, following that, there was some, some further steps that you were involved in? 
Well, I think um, while we're talking about Townsville and our involvement there, Jeannie might like to talk about her involvement in establishing Black Ink Press. So while um, John was doing community development, um, I had a bit of a, well, actually, I had thought that I might, having in most of the time in Cairns, I'd been doing other community do, um, art sorts of projects and um, exhibitions and things, and I thought I might get back to writing picture storybooks. And I put a few things out to some publishers and was basically knocked back everywhere. Um, and I, so, you know, publishing had moved on, things had changed. And I thought to myself, well, if I can't get published and I'm an already published successful person, then what chance has an Aboriginal or Islander writer or, or illustrator mm. got to have their book published? Mm. Um, and so I decided to set up an Indigenous publishing project. Um, so I went out and sought um, some support amongst, so people basically didn't even know what publishing meant. So anyway, um, to cut a long story short, we gathered people together. We, um, well, we decided, I decided that this is not something I could do on my own. I had to be part of an Indigenous organisation. So I managed to control the um, organisation, the Congress organisation that John was with, to, um, to be my support. And um, got some little bit of funds and worked on getting funds and um, finding writers and or potential writers and illustrators and um, started producing books mm. and um, building up a, a market. Um, so this took, I was working on this for 12 years. Um, we published 75 books, or basically all picture story books, by almost all by Indigenous writers and illustrators. Uh, had about a hundred people on our on our lists of, and um, yeah, it was good. It, mm. Um, mm. The sadly, the organisation, well, to cut a sh long story short again, I guess, collapsed. And um, although we could have, Black Ink Press could have survived, but um, because of the machinations of the um, Indigenous organisation that. Um, owned us, didn't, um, and, yes, yeah, some they kicked, kicked me out and my staff and tried to do it by themselves, but it didn't work. So um, that just came to a grinding halt, unfortunately. Um, the books are, books are still there, but you can't get them anymore. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that's that part of it. Council. Mm. Mm. Thank you. So, yeah, so, so then I was no longer doing that, and John also pulled out of Yalgabindi because it's changed its um, position. He, it was no longer a, a community or a church organization, it was a, a one man band, and John wasn't prepared to be the drummer in a one man band, so he was retired from that. Yeah. And, and you work with the, the Aboriginal Church. Mm. You want to talk about that? Well, but just my last role before we moved to Melbourne um, was as a presbytery minister for Calvary Presbytery, which is the Queensland branch of the Congress, which has still has, I think, seven congregations. Mm. So there's the old mission communities of Martoon, Weeper on Apronum, Araku in Mornington Island, congregation in Cairns, one in Townsville, and one in Brisbane. So I, um, I was the support person for the Congress through Calvary Presbytery for five years. Mm -hmm. And then I, we came to Melbourne. Yeah. And as soon as John pulled out, they, um, they got rid of that 
Presbytery. Mm. It's another, another sad, contentious story. <laughs> the organisation sounds like a, um, you know, a, a potential threat in, <laughs> in these stories. Yeah. The organisation, yes, yes. The, the, people run the, the people who run the organisation. The organisation in itself is not a bad thing. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Um, mm. So that was your your um, publishing thing, Jenny, was Black Ink. Black Ink Press. Black Ink, Black Ink Press. So if anyone uh, with that, no that, relationship whatsoever to the Melbourne-based Black Ink publishing yeah. company. We yeah. spelt with an I. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So if you ever come across that Black Ink Press, um, you'll know what you're looking at. <laughs> um, I'd, like, yeah, but I'd like to move now to, to the, perhaps the, um, the question as to how do you think, firstly, how do you think God's been involved in all this? And how do you think you have changed in this process or anything that you, any intuitions you might have in that area? I guess you could say we have a sense of call and whether you'd want to um, put in the terms of, you know, listening to the call of God, but it was a, for us, it was a calling that we would become involved in uh, community work and working with First Nations people in Australia. That became a commitment mm. that we made early on in our lives together. And I think we've, we've tried to remain true to that calling over the time that we've been involved in the church, despite the challenges that uh, we've met and some of those Jenny has mentioned. And we're still continuing today um, in ways that we think we can be helpful, especially around now, the, uh, the uh, referendum, the forthcoming referendum and campaigning for the yes, mm. vote for the referendum. Mm. Um, I'd like to... How we've changed. What about how we've changed? I'd like to hear how you've changed before we go on to talk about the <laughs> We haven't changed. Yes, we haven't changed at all, I know. <laughs> nah. Uh, oh, dear. You, you, don't, you don't notice the change when you're doing it. This is what I would you say. You don't notice the change. No, no. I'd like to think we've become more um, open and tolerant and patient over the years. Um, mm. I think one of the things, um, if you're living in um, in an Aboriginal community and we were closely, um, you know, part of families within that community, um, what an experience such as that one of the effects that it has on you is to is to um, remind you where you have racism within yourself. It's, it challenges your own attitudes, challenges your own preconceptions, and challenges you in ways that can be quite unexpected because a lot of our attitudes and values um, we take for granted. A lot of our uh, attitudes to the world can be um, can be unacknowledged, really. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, one has to confront the, the fact that we're white fellows. We were educated and brought up in a in a um, in the dominant culture and we need to understand how that affects who we are mm. but also sorry um i will say that i although i can never claim to be aboriginal uh, or um, indigenous i find myself always seeing the world sort of as if I were, so that when I read things, mm. 
I will say, I will always find myself thinking, well, how would an Aboriginal person read this? How would they feel about this? Um, would they understand it for a start? Mm. Um, or you hear people speaking, or when I speak on the rare occasion, I speak publicly. Um, it's I always try to to I find yeah to speak as if someone in the audience is Aboriginal, and how will they accept and uh, um, find what I'm saying? Mm. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a a learning that I hope is good, and I yeah. I think we could all do this a bit more of that. I think that's a really fundamental point that you have a different frame of reference because you know you, you know what Aboriginal people are likely to think about many mm. things that are said quite carelessly in the dominant culture. Um, and mm. that's a knowledge that you have and that other white folks don't have or haven't acquired or, or could acquire, mm. haven't acquired. Mm. And then that leads into our mm. present discussion about the voice and the... Uh, 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 the, the noise that's going on uh, around the debate. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to uh, the rest of us about uh, your perception of the voice from this point of view? You know, the, the, the debate about the voice is what I'm asking. I'd like to, to us to hear more voices, uh, more opinions from the people who don't have voices. Because the the people who are talking about it, and even I, I think the media are pretty lax in this. I mean, have we heard any voices from Cape York or even from Arnhem Land or the Kimberley, except the June Oscar? Um, have we heard from those the the people who really need a voice, and they're the ones that Australians don't know about, and that's why Australians are only listening to the those loudmouths. Hmm. Mm. Well, Sandy, from the community development point of view, the programs and uh, improvements that can actually positively affect the community are ones that have been um, worked out in in conjunction with the communities themselves. Mm. So when people's home voices are heard and taken uh, taken account of, and people have input into um, how government or other bodies might want to uh, relate to a community, then the outcomes are going to be much more positive. So when people at the grassroots have a voice, then if that voice is able to be uh, listened to and, uh, and to have an effect, then there's going to be much better improvements for Aboriginal mm. and Torres Strait people. Indeed. In, in fact, the other thing is that one of the things that's obvious now is the individual voices coming out from these people who have their different opinions. Well, that's not surprising considering Australia, uh, Aboriginal people consist of hundreds of different nations, um, but a well-organised advisory group could actually bring people together. Or like John said, with his community development, when those students came together, they came from all over the place, but they got to know each other and understand each other's positions. Well, you know, Aboriginal Australia could do with a little bit of that as well. Yeah, I, think that, I think that's a really interesting and important point, that the formation uh, of a voice committee from across the nation will actually do something which isn't there now. Uh, which is, as you say, mm. to uh, bring together the different concerns and, and aspirations so they can uh, work something out uh, which is fresh and which addresses the various needs. And there are so many various needs mm. across Australia. Mm. Um, yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, it's yes, really it's hard to understand. That could be opposed, really. <laughs> well, it, it's quite it, baffled. It, it seems to me that um, people have, have been stirred up with with uh, fear by this phony uh, equality that we all have equality before the law. Um, I like to say <laughs> that the law, in its Majesty, forbids rich people and poor people alike from sleeping under bridges. 
<laughs> the 19th century Frenchman. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an issue that's been around for a very long time. But anyway, yes, only equality is the only thing they've got to positively uh, uh, allege against the voice, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for what you've shared. Is there anything that either of you would like oh. to say in, in conclusion? As we're moving to conclude. So. Oh goodness! Thanks, thanks to the SCM for bringing us together. <laughs> yes, thank you to the SCM. I agree with that entirely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, oh look, it's um. I mean, looking back. The SCM has had that um, the perspective of the SCM that we um, became in, involved in and were linked to back in the days of Monash, with its emphasis on justice, its emphasis on um, politicisation. Remember? Yeah, mm -hmm. inquiry, politicisation, daring to think um, beyond convention. All of those things. We would want. Uh, that's a gift that Jenny and I've received through our involvement over the years. And, you know, it would be good if that can be something that others can experience as well. We do hope so. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, thanks very yeah, much. Thanks, Sandy. And I'll, just, I'll just turn on the, uh, the video and you can see my smiling face. I'm so pleased to have heard what you've said today. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, to all okay. the people around yeah. listening, uh, we wish you well for this journey. <laughs> the invitation is yeah. from all of us, and I, I would say it's from God, but it's also, you know, from the uh, the history of people who have sought to follow the calling in the past. Um, the calling is not new, not different, and it's there now. Mm. Thanks again. Mm. Uh, well, well, uh, let, let me just finish with a prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you for the SCM and what it has meant in our lives and for your call to ministry to all with a vision for all and a hope for all, particularly the most needy, the most distant and the most conflicted. And um, give us the courage not to shy away from the times of difficulty and confrontation, but to listen to your voice and to each other better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 John and Jenny, thanks again. Yeah. Good. I'll stop the recording.